Greetings, brethren. My name is Matthew Clark. I'm a past master of Britannia Lodge in Victoria, British Columbia, on the west coast of Canada. I'm here tonight to offer you an introduction to some of the mysteries contained in my book, The Point Within the Circle, bounded by two parallel lines, which has been released and is being distributed by Lewis Masonic Supplies. I'd like to start by thanking Martin Fox, their director, for allowing me this opportunity to introduce my book to you. I'm gonna start this introduction by making a, what may seem to many of you a very bold statement. And that is that the ancient stone circles of Britain are alive and well in the design of Freemasonry and in fact, in our ritual and in our lodge work. If you'll allow me, I'm going to present to you some of the evidence which causes me to believe this, and you can form your own decisions based on the evidence presented. In order to present the evidence, I'm going to ask you to bear with me while I share my screen so that I can show you some of the pictures which will help. Hopefully you can all see the picture there. This is the cover of the book, The Point Within the Circle, which has uh, just been released by Lewis Masonic. Now, the symbol of the point within the circle, to me also shows the inner meaning of the, or the allegory for the ornaments of the lodge. And I'll show you why. And we're gonna start with the symbol itself the point within the circle, bounded by the two parallel lines. Now, you may not have much familiarity with this symbol, but in fact, it's there both in our Entered Apprentice um, lecture and also on the tracing boards for the first degree. In those tracing boards, it's accorded a position of importance, which is on the side of the pedestal. This here is the EA board by Kenning. On the left, you can see the board itself. And on the right, a magnification of the pedestal on that board showing the symbol. There's another one from Donaldson, 1845, similarly placed. And here it is on the um, pedestal from the Corinthian Lodge of Amor. This symbol is so important that it is placed on the pedestal where we all take our oath. And why is that, that it's accorded this position of importance? Well, I'd like to start by giving you a brief quote from Albert Mackey in his book, The Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. He says, the point within a circle is a symbol of great importance in Freemasonry. Everybody is well acquainted with the usual explanation of the symbol. We're told that the point represents the individual brother and the circle, the boundary line of his duty to God and man. And the two perpendicular parallel lines are the patron saints of the order, St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist. Now this explanation, he continues, trite and meager as it is, may do very well for the exoteric teachings of the order. But the question at this time is not how it has been explained by modern lecturers and Masonic system makers, but rather what was the ancient interpretation of the symbol and how should it be read as a sacred hieroglyph in reference to the true philosophic system which constitutes the real essence and character of Freemasonry. That's from Albert Mackey's Symbolism of Freemasonry, 1869. Now, to look at the deeper meanings of the symbol, let's start with the symbol itself, with the glyph, and let's start with the center. Center is a circle with a point in the middle drawn by a compass. And this is the symbol and glyph of the sun and of the deity. In fact, every circle drawn by the compass 
is the symbol of the sun and the symbol of deity. And this may be one of the reasons why the compasses figure so prominently in our system. Further, we're told that the two parallel lines are attributed to the two saints, John, uh, the patron saints of Freemasonry. Now, in order to show you why they are attributed to the two saints, John, I have to take you back a long time ago and show you how a stone circle is laid out and built. And this will reveal the beginnings of the connections between the stone circles, Freemasonry, and ancient Judaism. I say ancient Judaism because we are instructed in our lecture that our temples are built in this line in the same fashion as was the temple of King Solomon, and that it itself was built and aligned according to the rules of the alignment of the tabernacle. From your readings in the volume of the sacred law, you're probably well aware that the tabernacle was not a building, but was rather a tent that was carried with the Israelites during their travels and was erected when they stopped, and that the temple was aligned always due east and west. Now, as they had no compasses at this time, how was it aligned? Well, let's start here. Two men, the assistants of the priest, would go to where the temple, the tabernacle was to be erected. And one man would stand in the east. And when the sun rose, then the shadow of his staff would fall directly due east and west. And the other gentleman would place his staff at the other end of the shadow. And thus this shadow running from the sun was how the tabernacle was aligned and it would form the center line of, for the building of the tabernacle. Now it's very interesting a couple of things about this are very interesting. First of all, those attendants of the priests were called diaconos. And of course, in modern English, this is the deacons. Second, the staffs that they carried, which were about six feet in height, were referred to as the Asherah. Now, Asherah was a Canaanite goddess who between about 850 BC and 250 BC was considered the consort of Yahweh. She was also the mother of the gods. And in particular, she was mother of two gods, Shekhar and Shalem, which is the morning star and the evening or peace. And that Shalem is still reflected in the Jewish name for their capital, Jerusalem, the city of peace. So we have the two, the morning, and the evening. And it's interesting that in various times and places, the lance tips of these deacons um, uh, show the sun and the moon, showing the sun showing the light in the east and the moon showing the sunset in the west. So now that we know how the tabernacle was aligned and the temple of Solomon, and the lodge, we can go back to the building of the stone circle, for it is aligned in the same fashion. We start with two men who are going to mark where the stones are placed. And on the longest day of the year, they approach the plain where they're going to build the stone circle. And at sunrise, one holds his staff in the east and the shadow falling towards the west the other man places his staff in the center of the circle on the shadow line. And the man standing in the east marks the place where his staff was held with a stone. And this is the most northeast point of the circle. And <clears throat> it's interesting that Masons, even to this day, start their operations on St. John's Day the longest day of the year, and they always place their stone, the first building stone, in the northeast corner. Now, whether it's for this reason or not, 
I can't say, but it certainly fits. On the evening of that same day, the men come back, and again they place a stone where the sun sets and its shadow falls across the center line. And these two stones, morning and evening, form the first two stones of the circle. Now, brief, uh, brief foray into science, a little refresher course. On the longest day of the year, the sun is at its most northerly point, and it rises in the northeast, sets in the northwest. But as we move towards autumn, towards the uh, equinox, the sun gradually moves towards the south. And on the uh, equinox itself, the sun will rise due east and set due west, and the day and night will be of equal length. And as we continue further towards winter solstice, the sun continues its movement towards the south. And on winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, the sun rises in the southeast and sets in the southwest. Returning to our stone circle, after the men have marked the first two stones, they wait 30 days and they return and they repeat the procedure. But the sun having shifted towards the south gives you two slightly different placements for the stones. And in another 30 days, they come and do it again. And in another 30 days, it will be 90 days and will be at the autumn equinox where the days and nights are of equal length. They continue their procedure, marking the dawn and the dusk every 30 days until we get to winter solstice and the circle is complete and there in so the stones rise and set in the southeast and the southwest. Well, what about the two saints, John? If you rotate the circle a little bit so that you can see the sun in the east on um, autumn equinox, then we'll be able to show. Because the two saints, John, are talked about as our patron saints. But why is this? They aren't our patron saints in the normal sense of the term. They were not Freemasons. Freemasonry didn't exist as we know it in those days. <clears throat> Nor did they espouse particularly Masonic teachings. But one reason is that their birthdays. St. John the Baptist was born on summer solstice, the longest day of the year, June 24th, uh, which we still call St. John's Day. Now, of course, the, the calendar has shifted a few days since the ancient Roman times. Uh, now it's June 21st, 22nd. But at that time, St. John the Baptist was born on the summer solstice and St. John the Evangelist, his birthday is placed by the church uh, just after winter solstice, December 27th. Thus, by enshrining these two as our patron saints, Freemason was able to establish the importance of these solar festivals in their symbol and in their ritual while keeping a veil in front of the eyes of the profane. Returning to our stone circle, you can see here that on the due north and due south of the circle, there's a gap because the sun never rises due east and due west. And if you draw a line between sunrise and sunset on the summer solstice, <clears throat> excuse me, and sunrise and sunset on the winter solstice, you can see that the two parallel lines formed by these gaps form the lines of the Saints John. They're also referred to as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Well, the beginning is the first day of the construction of the circle, and the end is the last day of the construction of the circle. And between these lines of the Saints John is the ring of stones and representing the sun. Now, 
I can't get much into the function and use of the circle at this point. It's, it's too complex. But I can tell you that very briefly, it does form a calendar. Anyone sitting in the center of the circle can tell what day of the year it is by seeing where the sun rises, between what stones and where it sets. And it's the same no matter where you build the circle. And you can prove this to yourself. If you sit in your own backyard and you put a stone on the fence on your birthday, um, every year when the sun rises, it will rise precisely over that stone on your birthday, provided you don't move your chair, of course. Okay, so going back to the two saints, John, we can see that the sunrise and sunset, two saints, John, with the sun, form the point within the circle bounded by two parallel lines. <clears throat> Now, we have to bring this back to Freemasonry. And in order to do that, we're going to bring it right into the lodge. And to do that, let's start by setting up the pillars that align the tabernacle. The sun rise in the east, I've marked as a white pillar. The sun set in the west, I've marked as a black pillar. And the sun at the equinox with the sun due overhead is the meridian. And this forms an interesting and better answer to the question, why is the sun always at its meridian with respect to Freemasonry? And why is the North referred to in Freemasonry as a place of darkness? Now, it's easy enough, having established the pillars, to put in the principal officers. As the sun rises in the East to open and enliven the day, so the worshipful master is placed in the East. As the sun sets in the west, so the senior warden is placed in the west to close the Walt Lodge. And the sun at midday is ruled over by the junior warden. Looking at these three pillars from overhead, we can see again the sun in the east with the worshipful master, the sunset in the west with the senior warden, and the junior warden with the sun at its meridian. Now we've been instructed in our lecture on the first degree that the two parallel lines on the sides of the um, tessellated border are the lines of the two saints John. And since we know from our construction of the circle that the two saints John are the side lines of that uh, construction of the sun circle, it's easy enough to add in the other stones. And when we do that, we can see the parallel lines here, sunrise and sunset on the day of the line of John the Baptist. Sunrise and sunset form the line of St. John the Evangelist. And there we have the circle with the two parallel lines uh, brought right into our temple. It's also interesting that in that same first degree, under the apprentice, we're informed that the method of standing in the northeast part of the lodge is left foot across the lodge, right foot down the lodge, a position that always seemed very awkward to me until I realized that joining it with the EA degree, with the fellow craft, we found the circle squared after a new and interesting fashion. Thus, the plane of the squared circle is the flat plane of the lodge where we all meet. We're also informed in that first degree that um, we derive some of our concepts from the ancient Egyptians. And it's interesting to note that um, the hieroglyph for the priesthood um, seems to show a man sitting inside the stone circle with the sun rising and Venus rising um, before the sun. Now that interpretation is from Knight and Lomas in their book, Uriel's Machine. It's also in um, the dictionary of Egyptian symbols. 
I would say it rather means a group of men who use sticks to measure the heights of the stars, but really it forms the same, means the same thing. And there is the hieroglyph for the priesthood. Now I mentioned the ornaments of the lodge. The ornaments of the lodge, we're told, are the pavement, the tessellated border, and the blazing star. And I put it to you that the pavement represents the earth, the flat plain whereon we all stand and whereon the circle and the pavement are erected. And the tessellated border, we're told, refers to the planets, which form a dance around that grand luminary, the sun, which is the blazing star. Thus, in the, in the uh, allegory of the ornaments of the lodge, um, the secrets of the sun and our universe, our, our world, are concealed and revealed. Revealed in symbol, conceal, concealed in allegory. The light dawns. Brethren, this is the first of three mysteries that I have revealed in my book, The Point Within the Circle, bounded by two parallel lines. Besides the ancient mysteries of the stone circle reflected in the lodge, in the book I show you two other mysteries, or at least two, one being how this is associated with the Kabbalah, the ancient Jewish wisdom, and the other, how it is associated with alchemy. All of these are reflected in the point within the circle, bounded by two parallel lines. I urge you, brethren, or encourage you, to get a copy of my book, The Point Within the Circle, bounded by the two parallel lines from Lewis Masonic Supplies and contact them directly, or you can visit our site online, pointwithinthecircle.com. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to The Point Within the Circle. Figure out how to close this. Thanks again, brethren. I've enjoyed presenting this to you. If you have any questions, you can forward them to me by uh, contacting Lewis Masonic and Martin Fox.